What I'm going to do for the balance of my time with you is tell you one of these stories, uh, and it's the story about Roomba. Not the only thing iRobot does, clearly, but it is a, um, a wonderful story which I enjoy very much every day. So, where do you start such a story? Well, I start back in the beginning. In the beginning, there was Rosie. In 1962, many of us saw a TV uh, cartoon called The Jetsons. We saw this robot cleaning our floor and we knew exactly what we wanted. We wanted Rosie. He would come home, he would, Rosie would greet us at the door, she would have vacuumed our floors, made our bed, prepared dinner. This was great. And there was much rejoicing. <laughs> but then something less great happened. 28 years passed and there was no Rosie. People were not happy. There were many promises of Rosie. The best thing we actually delivered was fake Hollywood robots. Uh, things that, depending on your point of view, are either inspiring or annoying, but they are not useful and they are not Rosie. And so the general populace after the 28 years is perhaps represented by this individual, <laughs> skeptical. And that's about time when iRobot was founded. <coughs> we knew that cleaning the home was a great application. In fact, I would go up and say, hello, I'm Colin Engel, CEO of iRobot. And the person, rather than saying, good to meet you, Colin, or nice day, would always say, when are you going to clean my floors? True story. I, would, I could bet on this and it would happen every time. Rosie is not a joke. But we didn't know how to clean. We didn't know how to manufacture. And we were unfundable and had no money. So, perfect time to start a company. Oh, I'm not sure why. I'm no, we'll pass that. So, the, um, six years passed based on those humble beginnings. And um, I'll remind you of 14 failed business models. We were not sitting around. And, um, but we did start to learn some things. And the first I will share with you is something I call the asymmetric strategic partnership. And this is a partnership where a big company that uh, typically has money, has a channel to the marketplace, has a lot of knowledge about a marketplace, but for whatever reason believes that it is not innovative. It's a common uh, paranoia of large companies. Um, looks and finds a small company, that's iRobot in this case, who thinks it has cool technology and believes itself to be innovative. And there's a lot of ways big companies and small companies like to get together. If you're the small company, you're terrified of the big company because they're big and you're small. And that's scary. <laughs> no, also because um, they, you're dependent on them for all of these things and, and you want to ensure in a contract that they're going to deliver all these things to you. And if you're the big company, <coughs> well, you're afraid of um, you know, paying 175 times earnings multiple or, or be, being taken to the bank in some, uh, some way and looking foolish. So what we did was create a relationship where I gave the big company absolute control. Okay, I said that you, that's what you want and from my perspective I looked at a lot of contracts and realized as a small company you don't really have control regardless of what that paper says or regardless of the intentions of the people sitting across from you because chances are in two years they're going to be moved to a different department and their opinion doesn't matter and if the company for no reason other than it doesn't feel like it anymore decides to change direction whoops, <coughs> um, they're going to be forced to dump the project anyways. So if you give the big company control then you get to say, well, then I can't take risk, and so you need to cover my costs. But you'll need to only cover my costs. I'm a government contractor. I fill out time cards. You don't have to uh, pay me profit up front. And by not getting paid profit, 
I can make a claim to sharing the value that ultimately this partnership creates. And the big company likes that because it doesn't work. What they're getting is very, very inexpensive, high quality research. So we've done this six times, and it figures very prominently in the room of story. First, we did it with SC Johnson Professional. And we were interested, they approached us because they wanted to create robust industrial cleaning. Great idea. We created this robot here called the Auto Cleaner. That uh, you turn it on in the supermarket and um, it'll go find the dirty floor and, and, and go and clean it. We actually um, commercialized this product. Uh, partnered with Tenant and, and brought this product to market. And it was an interesting product, not ultimately uh, successful, but not because of the product performance. But we knew how to clean. So iRobot had, with no outside funding, three and a half years of elapsed time, become experts in the world of cleaning. The next asymmetric partnership we created was with Hasbro. Uh, you saw a little video of, 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 of a baby doll and, and this velociraptor. We worked with Hasbro for three years. And um, <coughs> we learned about manufacturing. This is my... The, uh, <coughs> we also learned about cost. We had a, a, a profound culture change actually happen in the company through this time. And that was that um, when we made the baby doll, that was a, a very cool thing, an artificial life form that uh, differed from uh, most interactive toys because rather than understanding how it was being played with by dictating how it should be played with, which is how most interactive toys uh, work, My Real Baby, it would sense how you were playing with it because it had sensors for rocking and, and the skin was responsive and so forth, and um, figure out how you were playing with it and uh, sort of add magic to whatever that play pattern was. It was a very cool toy at the time. And uh, our engineers were very, very proud of this. We had a lot of um, uh, technology in it. And then when the opportunity to create the Velociraptor came along, I remember this very well. The team of engineers came up to me and said, Colin, we don't want to do the Velociraptor. I said, what do you mean? What, how can you say you don't want to build a, a robot dinosaur Velociraptor that bounces <laughs> around and chomps things? And it's like, come on. Like, well, we already did animatronic life forms, and we don't think this is intellectually stimulating to us. <laughs> okay. They clearly had not bought into the make money part of that mission I, I had described earlier because, hell, we had, we had a, a Jurassic Park three tie and this was going to be great, and, and I pleaded with these guys, and ultimately they, they relented and worked on it. But that, role, that project ultimately was killed for cost by Hasbro, and the next project they developed and was green-lighted by Hasbro was ultimately killed, and the next, and the next, and the next. And we had a string of about 10 or 12 projects where we would come up with a great idea, propose it, only to see it die, because it was a dollar too expensive, because it was 25 cents too expensive. And a funny thing happened to the organization. We learned about the importance of price. And our engineers, instead of being on their high horse, this is below us, started to give each other props and you could get street cred at iRobot by taking a nickel out of a motor driver circuit. And that was huge for us. That allowed us to bring some toys to market that actually made it to market and it allowed us not only to learn about manufacturing, but learning about low cost design. <coughs>